Hey guys, today I'll show you a science fiction horror TV series named Severance, Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with a sexy woman lying on the conference room table, snoring like a pig. However, this is not a place for sleep. It was just an interview session, which was quite peculiar. It consisted of only five incredibly easy questions, such as, what's your name? And where were you born? Yet the woman couldn't answer any of them. Just as every one of you might lament the stereotype that beauty comes with no brains, the interviewer who walked through the door gave you guys a fierce slap across the face, stating that her answer was perfect. That situation is pretty confusing, and what is going on exactly? The scene shifts to Mark, who was an employee at Lumen Industries, a company that had invented a brain surgery to separate work and personal life memories. He had undergone the procedure two years prior. His workplace was located in the subterranean levels of the company, also known as the severance floor. As the elevator descended, Mark transitioned from his personal life memories to work memories, and his demeanor shifted from lethargic to invigorated. Upon arriving at his station, the inspector from the administrative department notified him to meet with his supervisor, Kobel. Kobel was a tough nut to crack. She informed Mark that he was being promoted to department manager effective immediately, taking over the role from the previous manager. While this should have been good news, Mark was concerned about the former manager, who was his best friend at the company. His inquiry, however, resulted in a verbal thrashing from Kobel, who then didn't forget to assign him to interview the candidates. She reminded him that the interview process should strictly follow the instructions in the manual. Every step was clearly laid out, with precise directions and follow-up procedures. He was warned not to improvise and cause trouble. The camera shifts to the room where Mark is conducting interviews. The individual being interviewed is the woman named Helly, who is shown earlier. She gives off an impression of exceptional efficiency right from the start. Her auburn hair also hints that she's not the type to be easily manipulated. Plagued by mysterious amnesia, she is irked by the man across from her who rigidly adheres to his script, avoiding answering her questions directly. This frustrates Helly to the extent that she grabs a tissue box from the table and hurls it at Mark, then turns to flee the interview room. Mark informs her that the door is locked from the outside. Helly shouts in a chicken voice for the release of her sexy body. Annoyed by her chicken noises, Mark allows her to leave. They traverse the labyrinthine corridors to the exit. Mark tells her that all she needs to do is to open the door to leave. Helly, however, finds that although she is able to push the door and leave, she ends up inexplicably back inside within the next second. After several futile attempts, she has no option but to seek Mark's help. He explains that it was Helly's own choice to return to the company. Helly finds it hard to believe and is unable to understand, so Mark takes her to complete her onboarding process, which includes watching a video that should clarify her confusion. The video is actually from the Helly outside the company, recorded for her in-company self as the final step of the standard onboarding process. It turns out that two hours earlier, the outside Helly had voluntarily undergone Lumen's memory severance surgery so that her work and personal life memories would be split and not interfere with each other. Once inside the company, she would only retain her work-related memories. This being her first time in the company meant her memory slate was effectively wiped clean. The moment she stepped outside through the door from the corridor, her memory switched from work to personal life, turning her into the off-duty Helly, who had no recollection of wanting to leave the company just moments before in the corridor. She only remembered undergoing the surgery under the care of the inspector. He told her that walking inside through the corridor would complete the onboarding process, so the outside Helly chose to walk in. Upon entering, her memory switched from personal life to work, becoming the inside Helly, and at that moment, she forgot what had just transpired in the stairwell, only remembering stepping out and then back in again. This complex setup is inevitable for a newcomer being toyed with amidst applause. In the scene, because exiting and entering the door causes a memory switch, when Helly rushes out of the corridor, her speed is too fast and she is bound to fall. Additionally, each time she enters from the stairwell, she shows a moment of hesitation and pauses in her steps, a natural result of the memory switch. Of course, there might be questions regarding how someone with a blank work memory can speak right after surgery and interact normally upon entering the company. The severance surgery is designed to retain learned knowledge and skills, which are shared across both work and personal life memories. On her way to the surgery that morning, Helly had a conversation with the inspector, who said he liked to see the sunrise light up the company founder carved on the wall, who used to drink milk with three raw eggs every morning as his favorite breakfast. 
During the following interview, Mark asked a total of five questions, which could be categorized into three types. The first type pertains to learned knowledge, such as naming a state. The second type is information from the day itself, such as the information that the inspector revealed to Heli on their way to the surgery room, like what the founder's favorite breakfast is. The third type is daily life information, which includes three questions, the interviewee's name, the state the interviewee was born in, and the eye color of the interviewee's mother. Heli answered correctly by naming a state, indicating that the severance surgery doesn't affect learned knowledge. It is reasonable to assume that learned skills are also unaffected, or else she wouldn't be able to function normally at work. However, for the other two types of questions, whether daily life information or information from the day of the surgery, Heli couldn't answer, which shows that regardless of the time frame, any personal life information is affected by the severance surgery. Heli completes her onboarding process. It's worth mentioning that something happened when she left work. When the elevator doors opened, we know Heli had switched to her personal life memories. Curiously enough, the inspector refers to the Audi Heli as a company veteran. It seems Heli's identity is more complex than meets the eye. Additionally, after work, Heli nearly got hit by Mark in the parking lot. While Mark is a diligent and ambitious worker within the company, possibly on track for a promotion, he's a complete homebody outside the company. After work, he just goes home to drink excessively, and when he's had enough, he crashes on the couch. Mark's sister, Devin, doesn't think this is a sustainable way to live and occasionally drags him to social events. This time, the discussion group was organized by her husband, who is a doctor as well as a thinker. As the conversation flowed, the topic shifted to Mark's severance surgery, and being gossiped about to his face made Mark uncomfortable. The gathering ended on a sour note. It turns out that Mark's wife died in a car accident a few years ago. Devin believes that Mark underwent the severance surgery to escape the pain of losing his wife. But in reality, apart from work, Mark does nothing but drink himself to sleep. By separating his work memories, he has no social life outside the office. He can't stop missing his wife and has intentionally maintained this state to isolate himself from the world. While eating at a barbecue restaurant, Mark's former manager, Petey, who had left the company, showed up. Petey had undone the severance surgery with the help of a mysterious person and regained his work memories. He revealed to Mark that the Lumen Company was involved in shady dealings and he was now being hunted by the company. Outside the company without work memories, Mark was clueless about Petey and naturally could not empathize. But Petey was convinced that Mark would help him and left a card with an address on the back, hinting at the answer if Mark went there alone. The weekend is over and it's back to work time. Heli told Mark that here, nights and weekends seem non-existent. As the department's new manager, Mark is tasked with introducing Heli to colleagues and familiarizing her with the work. The bearded Dylan is an outstanding employee in his department. He showed Heli various work awards he had received, ranging from mediocre eraser finger puppets to the highest honor of his own comic portrait. The older employee, Irving, is of average ability but has been with the company for a long time. His loyalty and obedience are unmatched, though he has no official position and often tries to meddle in everything. Their job is to sift through encrypted numbers in documents, selecting those that trigger emotional responses and categorizing them accordingly. The work sounds monotonous and mind-numbing, which Heli cannot stand. She asked Mark how one could resign, and Mark told her it's not that simple. To resign, one would need the agreement of their Audi self. At the subsequent orientation meeting, Heli expressed a desire to communicate more with her Audi self, but the inspector quickly dissuaded her. The Lumen Company strictly limits communication with the outside world. Taking notes out is not an option, as there are code recognizers in the elevators that prevent any written information from being transmitted. The control is so strict that when their former manager Petey left the company, he only informed them of the outcome. As for why Petey resigned or what happened to him outside, they were kept completely in the dark. Heli questioned Mark on why he no longer inquired about his best friend Petey, just because the inspector said not to ask. Heli's question did not receive a straightforward answer from Mark. It seems that everyone has become accustomed to this rigid control outside of work, reminiscent of the prison walls. At first, everyone hates them, but once you get used to living within them, and over time, you find yourself depending on them. Mark and the others have long been a part of the control system, but Heli, having only joined the company two days ago, clearly isn't accustomed yet. Heli doesn't believe in this control and craves freedom, so she immediately makes a request to resign. Heli says she doesn't want to do document sorting, never see the sun again, or experience friends disappearing. 
Mark told her about the code recognizer in the elevator, but Heli asked if he had ever actually tested it, skeptical of its existence. Mark wasn't lying, though. Heli, carrying a note as a reminder to her Audi, dashed into the elevator and thus triggered an alarm, failing in her attempt. The ensuing security was to take Heli to the restroom for punishment, but Mark arrived and took the blame, accepting the punishment on her behalf. The path to the restroom was narrow and dim, and at the end, Mark was met by the cold face of the supervisor, Koble. What punishment Mark received remains unknown. The scene then shifts to afterwork, where Mark is on a date with his sister's midwife. When Mark mentioned the effects of the severance surgery, to his surprise, the midwife suggested the possibility of juggling two relationships at once. Honest Mark was left dumbfounded. During a post-dinner walk, they encountered an organization which believes that the severance surgery equates to forced labor and imprisonment of another self. Mark, emotionally charged, confronted them and the encounter ended on a discordant note. However, outside of the company, Mark is still a kind-hearted person. This clash led him to question the morality of the severance surgery. He remembered the former manager, Petey, and unusually took a day off the next day to find him, following the address Petey had left him. It turns out Petey had regained his memory two weeks earlier and had drawn a map of the severance floor at the company. He speculated that the company might be involved in some shady activities. Mark felt that things were not so simple, so he took Petey, who had nowhere else to go, back to his own home's basement. Then, a short sequence showed us the temporal and spatial confusion Petey suffered after regaining his memory. After regaining his senses, Petey told Mark about a secret department within Lumen Company where employees can never leave the company. But whenever Mark pressed for details, Petey's memory became confused and they couldn't continue the conversation. Mark had no choice but to settle Petey down and return to the living room to begin his routine of drinking and watching Daniel CC Movie Channel. What he didn't know was that the neighbor lady had been monitoring his every move, and this neighbor was none other than his supervisor, Koble. It seems that Koble has been keeping a close watch on him or peeping at his personal life. After Mark went to work, his sister Devon and brother-in-law paid him a visit. The brother-in-law left a package at the door and departed. Right on cue, as soon as the brother-in-law was out of sight, Koble emerged, swiped the package, and snuck into Mark's house to explore the basement. Petey, ever vigilant, hid himself and seized the opportunity to escape while Koble was distracted by a phone call. Koble didn't discover anything amiss and drove back to work. The stolen package was handed over to the inspector later. Inside was a book published by Mark's brother-in-law, and this was the fifth book Koble had taken away. It seems Mark is not just an ordinary employee. Otherwise, Koble wouldn't go to such lengths to monitor his every move and use such extreme methods to isolate him from the outside world. Meanwhile, undeterred from her intention to leave, the in-company Heli tendered her resignation early in the morning, but as expected, she was instantly rejected by her Audi self. Stubborn as she is, Heli attempted to write on her arm, intending to tell her Audi self that she wanted to get out of the company, but Mark told her that such obvious writing would surely be detected by the machines. Undaunted, Heli then tried to seal a note inside a pen cap to swallow it like a capsule. Just as she was about to ingest it, Mark appeared and described the consequences. If it actually happened, the inspector would be responsible for retrieving it by cutting her open. Although Heli is rash, she's not foolish and had to temporarily abandon the plan. Mark knew that this couldn't continue for long. He couldn't watch her around the clock. Following Irving's suggestion, Mark decided to organize a team-building event, a tour of the company's perpetuity wing to strengthen the new employee's identification with the company culture. This so-called perpetuity wing is actually a wax museum of Lumen's founder and the successive CEOs, each wax figure accompanied by an audio narration of their achievements. They then arrived at the Smile Wall, where Irving, captivated, explained that it showcased the smiles of people Lumen had helped. Irving holds the company's past administrators in high esteem, reciting their deeds by heart. Unfortunately, the other three don't share this sentiment. Mark prefers to take it easy, knowing that worrying is futile. As Dylan mentioned earlier, he's only focused on performance and rewards. Company rules and brainwashing culture are worthless to him. Helly, being new, has nothing on her mind but to find a way to escape. During the tour in the Founder's Room, Heli found a passage leading to a corridor, which she used to escape to the hallway she couldn't leave on her first day. After smashing a window with a fire extinguisher, she held out a note through it, reading, Never come back here, hoping to show it to her Audi self to accept her resignation. But her plan was thwarted by Mark's timely arrival, spoiling her attempt. 
Helly looked at Mark, showing her resentment toward him. The situation has escalated quite a bit, and Helly is now facing the consequences of her rule-breaking actions. She was taken to the rest area by security to be disciplined. After walking down the dimly lit corridor, Helly entered the break room. Following a brief first aid treatment, the procedure commenced. The inspector instructed Helly to place her hands on the table and to sit facing the screen. A confession statement was then projected onto the screen, which Helly had to read with sincerity. Any trace of insincerity would fail the machine's detection. Helly read it more than 200 times, but still didn't pass. When work ended, the inspector informed her that she would continue the next morning. Helly's punishment plunged Mark into self-reproach. He reflected on whether he should have stopped Helly from trying to escape and realized that he actually didn't want Helly to leave. Wanting to make amends, he decided to replace his photo with a new one that included Helly. While changing the photo, Mark discovered the map drawn by Petey. This time, he didn't hesitate and hid the map. From the look in his eyes when he left work, it was clear that he was no longer the complacent Mark. The impact Helly had on him in just a few days awakened his independent personality. He began to view the events at the company differently. After work, Mark was also beset with troubles. He discovered that Petey had died at the gas station. To avoid unnecessary complications, Mark quickly went home to tidy up the basement where Petey had stayed. There, he found Petey's phone, which had countless missed calls. After some hesitation, he hid the phone. The next day, Helly returned to the break room and read the statement over and over, nearly breaking down. After 1,072 reads, she was sent back to the office. The actions of the company were eerily reminiscent of a cult's brainwashing tactics. But Helly was resilient, bouncing back quickly. She discussed the break room episode with Dylan, who generously taught her a trick. To fool the machine, she had to think of something she genuinely felt sorry about. For example, he liked to imagine his Audi persona sleeping with other men's wives, and he felt pity for their husbands. Enlightened Helly went to report her progress to Mark and discovered his secret of hiding the map. She exploded in anger, accusing Mark of hypocrisy for preaching to her about following rules while breaking them himself. Caught red-handed, Mark, who was long brainwashed, instinctively defended the company. Seeing his reaction, Helly realized she needed to take drastic measures. She confronted Mark, saying he was nothing but a lapdog, caring more about the company than his friends. But in a fit of anger, Mark destroyed the map. Just then, Irving came back to tell Mark that something big had happened. It turned out that while Helly was being punished in the break room, Irving was invited by Bert, the head of the optics and design department, to visit his department. Bert patiently introduced the department he managed, which had just two employees, whose daily work was to frame pictures and hang them in designated spots within the company. It's worth noting that Lumen's unspoken rules discourage interaction between departments, subtly fostering a sense of animosity that keeps them from mingling. Irving and Bert had only met during a wellness consultation two days prior. As they admired a painting, they felt love for each other, and nothing can stop it, not even the company's rules. On his way back, the impulsive Irving stumbled upon a book, the very one that Mark's brother-in-law had given to him. The inspector, for some reason, intercepted the book and started reading it himself, but then left it in the conference room amidst the commotion caused by Helly. The big news that Irving referred to was the discovery of a red book. Mark asked if anyone had encountered such a situation before. He knew that reading books not listed in the manual was absolutely forbidden. Perhaps spurred by Helly's earlier taunting, Mark said he shouldn't read it, but his body betrayed his words. Upon opening the book, he found a message to Mark, signed by his brother-in-law. Inside Lumen, Mark certainly had no memory of his brother-in-law, but he recognized his own name, so Mark hid the red book. The three returned to the office to find that Helly was no longer there. Her disillusionment with Mark's words had reached a breaking point, and she was determined to leave by any means necessary. Since textual messages couldn't be taken out, she had to think of something else. Helly, armed with a paper cutter, barged into Koble's office, threatening him for a video recorder. She intended to record a resignation message for her Audi self. If she didn't get the recorder, she would cut off her own fingers. Koble's expression made it clear that this was the first time she had seen such brazen behavior. Helly got her way, leaving with the recorded disc in the elevator. Before departing, she defiantly stated that although she had read the script in the break room for over 1,000 times, she was not subdued. Ultimately, Lumen taught Helly a lesson, as her Audi self sent her back to the company, along with a new disc. The wall clock indicated that more than two hours had passed during her elevator trip, and the despair Helly must have felt is imaginable. 
However, something even more brutal awaited her. Helly had always thought it was the company preventing her resignation, but the disc brought back contained a warning from her Audi self, saying that only her Audi self could make the decisions for her. The Audi then warns her in-company self that if she dares to joke with her fingers, she will make her regret being alive. This revelation left the in-company Helly completely dumbfounded. She had done so many escape attempts, including swallowing pen caps, threatening to cut fingers, and reading the script many, many times, only to find out that the one exploiting her was herself. Mark also felt the same shock. It turned out that their Audi selves didn't regard their company selves as human. They appeared unfazed, but undoubtedly a storm was raging inside them. The next day, everyone arrived at work on time. Everything seemed normal, but their minds were far from their work. Mark hid in the bathroom, where he found the red book he hadn't turned in. Through the book, his brother-in-law highlighted the essence of Lumon's control over them. Meanwhile, Irving began to assert his individuality, using the discussion about the paintings as an excuse to reconnect with his gay friend Bert. But this time, by chance, Irving discovered that Bert had lied to him. His department had more than just two people. At the same time, Dylan was no longer interested in work. He pretended to stay late to catch up, but instead began to read Mark's red book. The narration for this scene comes from the text he read. At the end of the workday, Helly exchanged friendly greetings with Dylan, then calmly headed toward the elevator. Facing the insults and threats from her Audi self, she entered the elevator, prepared to hang herself. The elevator bell dinged upon arrival, and Helly switched to her personal life memory. She struggled, and the panic and despair that flashed in her eyes was exactly what the in-company Helly wanted to expect, even if it cost her life. Mark was supposed to leave at a different time, but he swapped shifts with Dylan, who wanted to stay and read. In a twist of fate, Mark reached a turning point in his life. He swiped his badge and called the elevator to the ground floor. As the doors opened, he saw Helly hanging and quickly saved her, pulling her out of the elevator. The frequent shifts to Helly's point of view showed that she saw Mark's concern, a mix of love and pain. It was also Mark's moment of self-redemption. From that moment on, Mark saw the persisting defiance against authority in Helly, a shock that was undeniably profound. On Helly's first day back at work after her injury, the inspector instructed Mark to greet her return with a friendly gaze, and the ever-honest Mark did just that. To prevent Helly from attempting suicide again, the supervisor Koble arranged for the health consultant, Casey, to keep a close watch on her. After the suicide incident, Mark was awakened, no longer the obedient company man. He found an opportunity to send Casey away, found a safe place, and told Helly that although he had shredded Petey's map, he had drawn a new one. He now decided to uncover the truth with her. Helly was still upset and didn't want to bother with him, leaving immediately. Then by accident, they stumbled upon a strange department where a weird bearded man in a suit was feeding baby goats with a bottle. The goat wrangler muttered that they can't take them since they're not ready yet. This unexpected event eased Helly's tension. Mark finally found the chance to express his feelings, saying he's glad she was here and he had done all he could. Helly asked him to give her the map, saying she could draw it more detailed. From the moment Helly joined the company, Mark had always taken great care of her. On the surface, he seemed to be preventing her from breaking the rules, but in reality, he didn't want her to get punished in the break room. He even took the blame for her on occasion. Helly was well aware of all this. It was also Mark who saved her life when she attempted suicide. The concern and regret that Mark showed in the moment he saved her did not escape Helly's notice. Now, Mark is no longer the perfect employee. He boldly breaks the company rules to help her. His words sweetened her heart and gave her a way to gracefully accept his help. Meanwhile, there was a conflict when Bert visited his secret lover Irving. Irving confronted Bert about why he lied about the number of people in their department. Bert explained that there were often bad rumors about the macro data refinement department, such as them all having brood pouches containing larval offspring that would eventually consume and replace them. Bert suggested this could explain why he had such remarkable vitality. After they sent Bert back to optics and design, Bert showed Irving a painting. The painting depicted the love story between the company's founder and his wife, how they fell in love as colleagues. With this, Bert reassured Irving, implying there's nothing wrong with a workplace romance. However, at that moment, Dylan found a painting. From the ID badges depicted in the painting, it was evident that the macro data refinement department was slaughtering the people from the optics and design department. Previously, to prevent any contact between Irving and Bert, the inspector had deliberately shown Irving an image while he was making copies. The content of the image, however, was the opposite. It depicted the optics and design department slaughtering the people from the macro data refinement department. The inspector had, in essence, shot himself in the foot. 
The two departments now realized that the company was trying to sow discord between them. So, Mark led his department in collaboration with Burt's department for a joint action. For the first time, someone at Lumen Company publicly questioned the philosophy of the founder. Mark asked, if the founder's philosophy was about supreme light, then why couldn't they see any light? Why were they still working in the dark? Bert also responded positively to this. They decided to communicate with the previously discovered GOAT department. But before they could finish, the inspector appeared and ended their meeting. However, before leaving, Dylan managed to steal a card depicting a fighting action. Back at the office, they were greeted by their supervisor, Koble, who sang a brainwashing song praising the founder. Afterward, Koble verbally berated Mark before instructing security to take him to the break room for punishment. But the current Mark, having read and fortified his thoughts with the Red Book, was immune to such tactics and showed no fear. Coincidentally, in the corridor of the break room, he encountered the health consultant, Casey, who had just been punished for the incident in the corridor with Mark and Helly. Outside the company, the undercurrents were equally tumultuous. The inspector, outside working hours, arrived at Dylan's home. It turns out he had discovered through surveillance that Dylan had stolen a card, a card containing highly confidential information. The situation was urgent, so he activated a function called the Emergency Overtime Mechanism, remotely triggering Dylan's work memories from the company. Dylan reassured him that he hadn't taken the card outside, but had hidden it behind the toilet in the bathroom. It seems that the scanning devices in the elevator could only scan text, and such a card would not be detected. Just then, Dylan's son burst in. The inspector said to the child that he should wait outside because he had told him to count to 1,000. In disbelief, Dylan, with his work memories triggered, asked if this was his child. The inspector quickly made a call to disable the emergency overtime feature. After a zoom effect, Dylan at his home switched back to memories of his life. In an unexpected situation, the Audi Mark attended PD's daughter's concert. The lingering impact of the music was strong, or perhaps it was the conversation with her after the show that touched him. Using the cell phone left by Petey, Mark called a number that had been unanswered, connecting with a woman who led him through a maze of streets, informing him along the way that she was the company's tech employee and she had implanted Mark's chip. She was the only one who could disable it. The operation to restore Petey's memory was her work. If Petey heeded her post-op instructions and not wandered, he might not have died. Eventually, they arrived at a room in a dark basement, which seemed to be the place where Petey had the surgery. Mark thought the tech lady was going to operate on him and immediately clarified he did not want the chip to be deactivated. The woman, once an accomplice of Lumen, had accumulated too much guilt. She was well aware of the ugliest aspects of humanity brought by these surgeries. She said they should not bring someone into the experiment without one's consent just to fulfill their emotional desires. The Audi Mark realized the seriousness of the issue. He needed to correct his mistake. Just then, the security traced the tech lady's hideout through intelligence. She took the opportunity of the security's conversation with Mark to sneak up from behind, delivering a fatal blow with a baseball bat, not forgetting to make an additional cut. It seemed that those who could survive in Lumen were ruthless. The scene was too bloody, Mark could hardly keep from vomiting. The woman told him not to vomit to avoid leaving DNA. Mark had no choice but to swallow it back. Afterward, the woman gave Mark the security's access card, which had comprehensive permissions and couldn't be traced back to a user. She advised him to put it in his pocket when going to work. Mark inside the company naturally knew what to do. It appeared that the tech lady was well informed about the goings-on in the company's severance floor, probably due to an informant inside. The next day at work, possibly influenced by the tech lady's words from the night before, the Audi Mark felt conflicted, fearful that his conscience would pain him. He brought the security's access card to the severance floor. Upon opening the elevator, Mark saw the inspector waiting. Arriving at the office door, Mark discovered the company had installed a new door, which now required the inspector's card to enter. The inspector announced that due to Helly's excellent work, the precision of document inspection reached 75%, earning the department a five-minute dance break with music. With Helly choosing rebellious jazz, the office turned into a neon dance hall, flashing red, yellow, and blue, a rare opportunity on the severance floor, and everyone happily danced except Dylan, because the previous night's emergency overtime made his in-company self aware that he had a son at home, making him uncontrollably yearn to experience life outside the company and be with his son. However, the company's policies made this impossible, fueling his anger. 
The elegant jazz became grating noise in his ears, and the calls of his son echoed in his mind. As the neon lights turned a dark red, his anger peaked. He pounced on the inspector, demanding to know his son's name. Mark and Helly hurried to separate them. Confused and angered by the attack, the inspector threatened to report Dylan to the supervisor. But Dylan believed that the emergency overtime was the inspector's unilateral decision to cover a work mistake. And that morning, he had even asked Dylan to keep it a secret. If Coble found out, the inspector would be in trouble. So Dylan confronted him head on, and the inspector, having no recourse, spitefully canceled their dance break before leaving. Dylan then told everyone about the emergency overtime and how the company could remotely activate their in-company memories. He had seen his son outside the company. While everyone was pondering whether Dylan's son had anything to do with Dylan inside the company, Helly urged them to have some ambition and seize control of the memory device so everyone could see the outside world and understand who they really were. Subsequently, Mark pulled out the security's access card from his pocket, clearing the last hurdle on the path to the outside world. Everyone realized that the card couldn't be anything but fate's design. They decided to have Dylan stay behind in case the inspector appeared to stall him if necessary. Mark, Helly, and Irving headed to the security office in search of the emergency overtime controller. But as fate would have it, Irving suddenly went rogue, intent on finding his office lover, Bert. There's no turning back once the bow is drawn, so Mark and Helly reluctantly pressed on. Guided by memories of Petey's map, they located the security office and used the security's card to gain entry. Inside, as they had suspected, there was no one to be found. It was telling how a single security had been managing them on such a vast severance floor, a testament to the success of the previous management model. The walls were lined with monitors, evidence that from corridors to offices, they were always under surveillance. Helly discovered a room with strange devices displaying the employees' numbers and names, and green lights indicating that each was in working state. Scanning the room, Helly found their four names. On the panel, there was a knob for adjusting values and a switch marked Lock Unlock. This revealed that Lumen could exert various levels of control over them, akin to remote controlling robots. Helly then found an operation manual and began flipping through it when Mark spotted Koble on the monitors, taking the elevator to their floor. With time pressing, Helly hastily tore out the page containing instructions for the emergency overtime procedure, and they quickly left the office. Fortunately for them, Koble was in no position to cause them trouble at that moment, as the board had discovered the security's death. They had urgently communicated with Koble through the board secretary. Koble suggested that the person who had killed the security might be the same person who had restructured Petey's memory. The restructuring of memory had indeed occurred, and Koble intended to present evidence of this directly to the board members, bypassing any intermediaries. The prospect of restoring memories from the severance surgery shocked the board, and they reluctantly agreed to Koble's request for a direct meeting. On the other side, Irving found himself at Burt's Optics and Design Department. As he arrived at the entrance, he was taken aback. No wonder the inspector hadn't shown up when they were leaving. It turns out he'd been busy throwing a retirement party for Bert. Ironically, the ceremony began with a video of Bert's retirement speech, recorded outside the company. He knew he would never see his first love and closest friend, Bert, again. This was clearly the company's way of punishing them for the last time the two departments had met. After a ceremonious handshake and farewell with Bert, Irving followed the inspector out, lost in a maze of thoughts as he walked through the labyrinthine corridors. Love truly is the greatest. Even Irving, a loyal workhorse deeply brainwashed to see the company as his home, recognized the cruelty of his suppression for the sake of his love. From that moment, he no longer believed in the company's proclaimed values. He wanted nothing more than to destroy the place. When even the most stubborn conservative rebels, the coming events are certainly worth looking forward to. Meanwhile, the Audi Mark was gradually adjusting his mindset while on a date with the midwife, a girl introduced to him by his sister Devon. He was ready to welcome a new relationship, but his heart couldn't let go of his deceased wife, leading to the eventual breakup with the midwife. In a desperate attempt to salvage the relationship, Mark impulsively tore up a photo of his wife in front of the girl, but she left him regardless. Mark finally realized that his wife was perfect in his heart and he couldn't truly let another woman in. So piece by piece, he reassembled the torn photo. As the picture became whole again, it's revealed that Mark's wife was in fact Casey, the in-company health consultant at Lumen. Previously, Petey had told Mark about a strange department where people never leave the company. It seems that he was referring to someone like Mark's wife. The scene shifts and we get a glimpse of Irving's life outside the company. 
Returning home, Irving listens to the rock music and paints oil paintings, presenting a surprising contrast. The painting frame looks familiar, actually suggesting his intention to show through his paintings how Koble removed a chip from Petey's brain at his funeral. Back at the company, Helly was intently working at her computer. Mark and the others were in the break room, anxious as ants on a hot pan. Dylan had finished the quarterly work a week ago, but he still believed that with Helly's negative attitude, it was doubtful she'd complete her tasks. Although Irving had emancipated his thoughts, his thinking was still entrenched in the Lumen Company's ways. He suggested that they all stand behind Helly, sing her name, and cheer her on. Mark, however, had faith that Helly would finish on time. After all, for someone as relentless as her, who could be ruthlessly self-demanding, this workload was nothing. In the end, Helly did indeed complete her task on time. Then the four of them crowded around the computer to watch something akin to the end of game animation on an old Nintendo console. The purpose was, of course, a form of brainwashing. This practice of playing an animation as a reward after work completion also seemed to mock many companies. Like Lumen, they preferred to offer minimal material rewards and promise the moon to motivate employees. Here, Mark and his colleagues were not worried about failing to meet work goals for the company's sake. They were after the waffle pie party awarded for completing quarterly targets. The person who got this reward would stay at the company and spend a night at the founder's old home, which was a critical part of their next plan. But for some reason, Koble offered Mark an extra health consultation. Koble knew Mark's wife, Casey. Casey told Mark that she would retire after this psychological counseling and that she had just received the notice. Mark was shocked and wanted to help her keep her job, but had no practical way to do so. Casey shared her true feelings. Her favorite times were the eight hours spent observing Helly in his department, the longest she'd stayed awake in a stretch. Casey seemed different from the rest, being awake only for the half hour of her health consultation. Lumen had stricter control over her. She was the kind of person Petey had described, always staying inside the company. Koble, who supervised the health consultation, surprisingly showed a sad expression, yet her orders were to have the inspector take Casey to the testing floor. The passage to the testing floor was darker and longer. As Casey walked deeper, what awaited her was an elevator that opened automatically. When she stepped in and the doors closed, a ding sounded, and a red arrow pointing downward lit up. Clearly, Casey was not retiring as Koble had claimed. She wasn't leaving the company but going deeper into it. Comparing this image with a painting by Irving outside the company, they were exactly alike. Since Irving's painting is used to suggest how to remove a chip from the brain, this testing floor was likely where the brain chip would be extracted. Before the waffle pie party, the inspector arranged an egg snack tasting as a reward. The snacks were delicious and provided them with energy before their action. Holding an egg snack, Irving pondered in front of the founder's portrait, then read a piece of brainwashing doctrine from the employee handbook and looked at the founder's picture with mockery. Suddenly, he smashed the egg into the handbook, smirking. This indicates that the spiritual totem Irving had long believed in and followed was destroyed by his own hands. Perhaps it was the dazzling neon lights, but Mark completely opened up to Helly, expressing his utmost care for her. Suddenly, the inspector halted the event because Koble had been fired by the board for covering up Helly's attempted suicide. It seemed that Helly's Audi identity was not just that simple. Everything was moving in a direction favorable to Mark and the others. They held their final discussion before the action. Dylan stayed at the company to attend the waffle pie party and then went to the security room to control the memory switch, which would remotely activate their work memories. Since they couldn't be sure how long Dylan could control the switch, once they woke up outside, they shouldn't waste time investigating their personal lives, but find a trustworthy person to tell everything about the company. Finally, Mark took out the Red Book and used its maxims to encourage everyone, saying that their job is to savor the air of freedom, and the so-called boss may have the clock that times them, mocking them from the wall. These words boosted their spirits up. When they finally stood before the elevator, they were like soldiers on the brink of battle, their fate unknown. The intense emotions of parting made Helly drop all pretense, and before leaving, she and Mark shared a passionate but smelly kiss without using their tongues. Dylan entered the founder's bedroom, where waffles drenched in honey awaited him. After he devoured the waffles, a cheeky sentence appeared at the bottom of the plate, telling him to head to the founder's bed. The phrase was suggestive, to say the least. Looking up, Dylan saw the founder's head on the bed. It seems that this reward for Dylan was really just a trip to a haunted house. Approaching the bed, Dylan's hanging heart finally settled. Thankfully, it was just a mask. 
On the bed lay a whip, possibly used for S&M, but upon closer inspection we could see it's the whip with nine tails, each tail clearly labeled with one of the Founder's nine virtues. Dylan sat on the bed, donning the Founder's mask, and then three sexy women with different expression masks started dancing wildly in TikTok style. They were joined by an ugly man in a ram mask, forming the Four Temperaments Ensemble, which includes Woe, Frolic, Dread, and Malice. Indeed, their over-the-top styling really deserves each of them a good whipping. But with a task at hand, Dylan had to curb his bad temper and slipped away to the security room, leaving the baffled Four Temperaments behind. Dylan entered the security room and tied the door handle with his belt, locking the door from the inside. He reached the personnel control terminal and began to operate it by the book. After pressing the function key, he selected Mark, Helly, and Irving. Upon confirming the selection, the system prompted him to unlock the circuit, meaning turning the knob next to their nameplates to the unlock position. The system then displayed a series of operation options, indicating that the Lumen Company could precisely control the individuals who had undergone severance. Dylan chose the overtime option, which can switch the memories of people outside the company to their work memories. The last step for Dylan was to flip two switches on either side of the door simultaneously, which was a bit of a challenge for someone of his stature. Meanwhile, outside the company, Mark was invited to attend a party at his sister's house to celebrate the birth of her daughter. Since Coble had previously applied and was hired as Devon's lactation consultant, Devon asked Mark to invite their lactation consultant to the party as well. Upon arriving at Devon's home, Mark was immediately asked by his brother-in-law if he had brought the Red Book, as there was to be a reading of his new book at the party. However, the Audi Mark had been relieved of his book five times by Coble, so he hadn't even seen a single page of it. Wanting to avoid embarrassing his brother-in-law, Mark made up an excuse to dodge the question. Coble had just been fired by Lumen Company, and on the surface, appeared calm, but inside she was in a state of turmoil. She vented her frustrations under the pretense that her business was not doing well. To her surprise, Mark confided in her that he was also considering leaving Lumen Company. Coble was shocked by this revelation, but managed to keep a fake smile on her face. As Dylan flipped the second switch to change their personal life memories to the work ones, the real story for the selected three of them began to unfold. When Mark opened his eyes with his work memories back, the first thing he saw was his supervisor, which felt like a hellish start. He made an excuse about feeling dizzy and needing to use the restroom to quickly escape Coble's presence. In his flustered state, he ran into Devon, who was comforting her child. The in-company Mark, of course, didn't recognize his own sister and even thought that the baby might be his. Devon left to breastfeed, leaving a bewildered Mark behind. Later, while chatting with a guy, Mark found out that the woman holding the baby was his sister. With so much information coming at him in just a few minutes, Mark was struggling to process it all, not remembering he got a sister. Once Mark had calmed down, he was about to share his own situation with Devon when the book club event started. Holding that precious red book, he was undoubtedly shocked. Looking up, he was just a meter away from his idol. While it was thrilling to meet his idol, the shock turned to a secret delight when he learned that his idol was actually his brother-in-law. Mark was utterly engrossed in his brother-in-law's reading, unable to tear himself away. During the book club's intermission, Mark did what any fan would do. He approached his brother-in-law and praised his book for opening his eyes and changing his life, which, however, left the brother-in-law dumbfounded because he had sent Mark the book five times, and he acted as if had never seen it before. Then the brother-in-law mentioned that he was looking at photos that morning, including one of them on a hike together, and he felt sorry for Mark that he had to suffer alone from his wife's death. Mark wanted the photo to see what his wife looked like, but the brother-in-law was called away before he could give the photo to him, so Mark had to look for Devin again. Just as he entered the living room, he was stopped by Coble, who noticed his unease and kept asking him why he was so nervous. Mark was on the verge of getting through the situation, but the psychological shadow Coble had cast over him for the past two years was too much for him to handle. Mark claimed that he was going to take care of his sister's baby and called her Miss Coble, the name she used only in the company. His parting address gave him away and frightened Coble. Mark found Devin, but Devin's daughter was crying, so she handed the baby to Coble to care for. Mark's revelation stunned Devin. He asked her to find someone to look into the matter of the severance floor. Then Mark asked why he was sent to work for Lumon. Devin revealed that his wife had passed away shortly before he started working at Lumon. Mark also learned that he had been a history professor, but couldn't continue teaching normally after his wife's death, so he chose to undergo a severance procedure. 
At the same time, he found out that his wife was a particularly good person. Turning to Eyring after he was switched to his work memories, Irving was shocked to find himself to be a painter. He would listen to rock music and drink bitter coffee, staying up all night. This explained why he was always dozing off on the severance floor. Irving consistently painted the same image, a picture of the elevator leading to the testing floor. He did so probably because he wanted to retain the memory of this image in his subconscious, intentionally staying awake to make his in-company self sleepy and circumvent the severance surgery, and thus helping him recall things in his subconscious. From the medals displayed on the desk and wall, it was evident that Irving had been a soldier. In the wardrobe, he found a box containing a U.S. Navy uniform, and inside was a photo of a handsome man with father, written on the back. It seemed that Irving's father had also served in the U.S. Navy. Growing up in a military family might explain his strong compliance on the severance floor. It appeared that the severance surgery couldn't affect certain traits embedded in one's subconscious. Irving discovered a plethora of documents at the bottom of the box, all related to investigations into Lumen Industries and the severance surgery. It turned out that Irving outside the company was aware of the shady dealings at Lumen and had been conducting investigations long ago. Among the documents was a list of severed employees, and he found Bert's information, including his address. Attached was a map of Keir City, and upon searching for Bert's address on the map, Irving realized that Bert's name was already marked on it. It appeared that the Audi Irving had previously made contact with Bert, suggesting they were acquainted. Since Mark and Casey have a marital relationship in reality, they show a mutual fondness in their subconscious when undergoing enhanced psychological health counseling on the severance floor. Similarly, considering Irving and Bert's fondness on the severance floor and the fact that they knew each other outside the company, it can be inferred that Irving and Bert likely shared a close relationship outside the company as well. With no other friends or acquaintances outside the company, Irving had only one option, to seek help from Bert. So he drove to Bert's house. While waiting at an intersection for the traffic light to change, a white SUV approached, drifting around the corner. It was clear that the driver was in a great hurry. Inside the car, a frantic Kobel is behind the wheel. She's on the phone, urgently informing the inspector that Mark's emergency overtime protocol has been activated. She instructs him to shut it down in a hurry. The inspector senses trouble brewing and dashes a hundred meters to the security room, only to find the main door already locked by Dylan using a belt. The inspector struggles to open it. Meanwhile, Kobel learns that Heli is attending a banquet, a lavish PR event organized by Lumen Industries in celebration of the severance surgery. When the Audi Heli opens her eyes after she was switched to her work memories, she is in for a shock because the board secretary across from her informs her that she's scheduled to give a speech in 20 minutes. But an even more thrilling moment comes when the secretary introduces her to others. Heli's expression shifts from shock to a complex mix of emotions when she hears her outside name is Helena, indescribable, likely more unsettling than swallowing a fly. Exiting the elevator, the Audi Heli is dealt another blow by the sight that greets her. As the camera zooms out, we are left with the lonely silhouette of Heli, with people on both sides moving away from her. Ironically, the slowly rotating screens display Heli's beaming smile from the severance floor, the very place she yearns to escape from. The Audi Heli is in a hellish situation, a divine orchestration of the scene that vividly portrays her isolation in a helpless inferno. When Heli sees photo after photo that starkly contradicts reality, she may be speechless or even enraged. What's more, she felt devastated upon reading the statement of her own on a video, who claims that it is her family spirit that called her to this cause, but she took the experiment of memory severance because it sounded super cool. So she didn't think memory severance divides their spirits, instead, it unites them. Considering her previous suicide attempts, Heli fall into frustration upon knowing she's the one who caused all of these. Desperate to escape this hell, Heli rushes into the restroom, struggling to catch her breath. Then, an imposing yet seemingly aged figure appears. He is Helena's father, the current CEO of Lumen Industries and the son of its founder. He speaks with concern, revealing that he cried in bed when he learned of Heli's attempt to hang herself within the company. His words clearly show that he regards the in-company Heli as an enemy, a sentiment he shares with the Audi Heli, Helena. So when Heli hears such words, her anger reaches a boiling point. But her father's onslaught isn't over. He pushes further, trying to convince her. It turns out, Helena checked herself into the severance floor so as to partake in the severance surgery as a first-hand trial and a major PR stunt, while also demonstrating her resolve to her family and laying the groundwork for her future succession of her family business. Her tireless advocacy for the widespread adoption of the surgery inevitably led the experiment subjects, including herself, to the brink. 
Heli was aware that the burden of her sins was overwhelming. In front of a mirror, she recited the confession she had read in the break room. Heli knew that repeating the confession 1,072 times was nowhere near enough for atonement. Her gaze was resolute as she approached the stage, the same determination she had when walking to the elevator, but with one difference. This time, her anger was not for vengeance, but for redemption. At the same time, through a conversation with Mark, Devon knew that Mark's supervisor, Coble, was also their lactation consultant, and she had just entrusted her daughter to her. When Devon stepped outside, she saw Coble's car was already gone. Currently, Coble was driving recklessly towards the banquet held at Lumon. She arrived just before Heli took the stage, using Mark and the others to threaten Heli into compliance. Heli, standing on stage, struggled internally while her father watched from the crowd with high hopes. Meanwhile, Irving had arrived at Bert's doorstep. He saw that the Audi Bert had found a new partner. They seemed deeply in love, yet Irving proceeded to the door, his eyes full of the pain of a cruel fate and his fury towards Lumen. At the same time, a sweaty inspector was frantically trying to cut through a belt, ready to break in. Mark found the child in the study, but on the desk, he saw his wife's image among the photographs, and now he realized the health consultant Casey he met in the company is actually his wife. At this very moment, Heli was giving her speech, telling everyone that the truth about the memory severance was a lie. She said people undergoing severance surgeries were not happy, but lived miserable lives. They were prisoners being tortured in the basements. At that moment, the inspector also burst through the security room's door, engaging in a scuffle with Dylan and shutting off the system. With that, season one of this drama ends abruptly. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.